Enclosures are not some relic of the past. They're very much with us today. In fact, one could say that enclosures are one of the great unacknowledged scandals of our times. Here, let me give you some examples. Enclosures are everywhere and they're outrageous. Let's start with the land. Vast portions of Africa, Asia, and Latin America are besieged these days by an aggressive international land grab. It resembles the English enclosure movement of centuries ago when investors and national governments were snapping up millions of hectares of land that traditional communities have lived on and relied on for generations. But governments are okay with this silent theft. After all, privatizing land can help boost tax revenues for the wealthy and line the pockets of political cronies. And it could all be justified as development and progress, being modern. In practice, prosperity doesn't bring about development so much as dispossession and destruction. Land grabbing is often used to produce food for export markets, doing little to help feed the people who live there. Speculators often choose to leave the land idle. They just want to park their investment cash in a stable asset and try to cash in later when land prices rise. When investors in Saudi Arabia, China, and South Korea decided to buy land in Africa, the locals were evicted and can't grow and harvest their own food or hunt wild game. Their communities and cultures are shattered. People go hungry. They're forced to move to urban shanty towns and find their way as wage slaves and beggars and enter the modern world of consumerism. It's an ugly replay, again, of the English enclosure movement. Let's talk about development as itself as a form of enclosure. In Latin America, multinational corporations pressure governments to build mega-infrastructure projects so that they can more efficiently extract and export Latin American minerals, hydrocarbons, maize, and other raw commodities. The dozens of dams, mines, and highways built by taxpayers are then used to send all those resources to the rich nations of the North. This neo-colonial corporate plunder justifies itself by invoking free market economics and state law. But really, it's theft enclosures of the commons. The primary aim is cheap resources with minimal state oversight and poor working conditions, but the larger goal is to convert a system of commons stewardship and cooperation among people into an extractive market order. The winners are the already rich in corporations. Let's talk about water and the enclosure of it. Most people expect their drinking water to be a public service provided by governments or at least managed by communities. But multinational companies see water as a valuable private commodity that can be hugely profitable. This has prompted many companies and investors to buy up groundwater aquifers and municipal water systems. Bottling, co bottling companies then extract vast quantities of fresh water from public lands for minimal or no payments. And our water is poured into branded bottles and sold back to us at ridiculous prices. What used to be seen as a basic human right, access to water, has now become private property. The classic case of enclosure of water was the privatization of water systems in Cochabamba, Bolivia in the year 2000. It was a crazy scheme concocted by the engineering and construction firm Dactel with help from the World Bank. The official policy rationale was to provide incentives to private companies to improve the water infrastructure so that more people can have access to water. But this market solution resulted in price rises of 50% or more, and it became illegal even to collect rainwater from roofs. The corporatization of food is another area of enclosure. A century ago, Eric, Americans ate more than 6,500 distinct varieties of apples. People could choose from an exotic array of cultivars with names like scallop gildiflower, red winter pearmain, and Kansas keeper. When it came to cooking and eating, everyone had their favorites, usually local. People used different varieties for making pies, cider, and applesauce. But some varieties of apples happen to have thin skins, making them more susceptible to bruising and more difficult to ship, and others were considered too small or they served only a tiny niche of the market. So in the 20th century, to maximize the sale of apples, 
the industry built a sprawling integrated global markets. And this meant abandoning the natural diversity of apples in their quest for large-scale efficiencies and corporate consolidation, industrial agricultural agri- industrial agriculture pared back production of the wide variety of fruit and what was happened was has been a bland homogeneity of apples, all of it deliberately engineered. Today, only 11 varieties of apples make up 90% of the apples sold in the United States. Red Delicious alone accounts for nearly half of that. And you'd have to be pretty old to even know that apples used to be delightfully varied and locally grown and tastier than they are today. Most consumers have been trained to accept the narrow range of predictable choices as the way things are. It's another case of life conforming to the demands of highly commodified mass markets. The story of apples is just one example of this dynamic. Before the rise of grocery stores and fast food, there were countless local food traditions and styles of cooking in every corner of the world, often very localized. It shaped people's characters and attitudes and identities. But once chain restaurants and global branding arrived, the industrial system imposed uniformity and efficiency on food and it weeded out less lucrative in unusual foods. It built monoculture farms at the expense of biodiversity and food that was seasonal, fresh, local, traditional was abandoned. People's eating habits around the world have become more standardized and branded and corporatized, less nutritious. It's no surprise that the diseases associated with Western diets, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, have surged. Let's talk about another form of enclosure, privatization of infrastructure. There's nothing more lucrative than owning infrastructures that everyone depends upon. Imagine if a company could own the letter T and charge you every time you use that letter when you wrote something. It'd be a gold mine, of course. Well, that's the basic strategy that many large corporations use as they try to lock up technologies for themselves and monopolize markets. Years ago, Microsoft shrewdly gained control over 90% of computer operating systems through its Windows program. And then it used that to leverage sales of desktop applications like its Office suite of software programs. The company pressured computer makers to pre-install Office programs along with Windows. And Microsoft grew fat with enormous profits, which it used to stifle competition, introduce proprietary tech design, and control future markets. It's been a case of enclosing the commons of computer technical standards so that apps would not be naturally interoperable. In a similar fashion, Wall Street is big into enclosing infrastructure. It's aggressively purchased roads, bridges, and airports that we taxpayers have built and paid for. By acquiring equity ownership and long-term leases on this infrastructure, Wall Street then jacks up prices demanding new tolls and fees, and it gets huge returns with very low, if not guaranteed low, risks. A while back, Morgan Stanley bought a stake in a company that managed 36,000 parking meters for the city of Chicago. The company tripled parking rates, introduced meters where they hadn't been before, and reduced the quality of service. It turns out that the city government had sold off the rights to manage the parking meters for nearly a billion dollars less than the deal was worth. And now that the system has been privatized, the public has even less influence over how it's run. In many big cities, corporate branding has been used to take over public spaces that used to be free from commercial influence and spaces to celebrate local heroes. By selling the naming rights of sports stadiums, city governments and uh, other owners of those structures have turned stadiums into non-market non-stop marketing venues. Beloved stadiums now bear the names of Coca-Cola, Land Rover, and crypto companies instead of teams that are locally cherished. This is the story of enclosure. Treasured and special elements of life are stripped away. Locally distinctive experiences are eclipsed. And culture is homogenized as everything's converted into a lifeless branded product.
We see this in another area of enclosure, creativity and culture. Entrenched media industries have become experts in using copyright and trademark law to privatize creativity and culture. One of the most notorious offenders is the Disney company, whose very brand was built on appropriating folk stories and literary classics. Disney turned beloved folk stories like Pinocchio and Snow White and Peter Pan into their property. The stories have been taken private, and then Disney aggressively prevents anyone from reusing those characters as they might want to. The company once sued a daycare center that had painted painted their own version of Winnie the Pooh on its walls. In 1998, the Disney Corporation pushed the U.S. Congress to extend the length of copyright terms, all to prevent Mickey Mouse from entering the public domain and being usable by everyone. This sort of proprietary control over culture is epidemic. The Warner Music Group once raked in about $5,000 a day in royalties from the singing of Happy Birthday on TV and films or by waiters in restaurants. It took in nearly $2 million a year because it claimed to own the copyright to a song written in 1858. There are cases where McDonald's has threatened legal action against restaurants with names like McV- McVegan, McSushi, and McMuffin. McDonald's once prevailed against a, a motel chain known as McSleep for trademark infringement. The copying of a few musical notes sampling is another area of enclosure. It's often considered piracy, even though riffing on someone else's creativity is precisely how jazz and hip-hop and blues became rich musical genres in the first place. We can talk about enclosures of life forms, genes for plants, bacteria, animal clones, and other life forms are often claimed as private property under patent law. Currently, one-fifth of the human genome is privately owned via patents. So here's my takeaway about enclosure. It's entirely possible for markets and commons to play nicely together. This usually happens at the local or regional level when businesses are socially embedded and committed to their location. Markets don't always need to enclose the commons, but capitalism would prefer to get free or discounted access to the things we own and in, in things we manage as commoners. Investors want everything to be priced and traded so that they can make money off of it. They want to expand the scope of property rights to ridiculous extremes and not consider anything unavailable for sale. They want to have access to basic resources that everyone needs to live. They want monopoly ownership rights so they can squeeze out competition and prevent the rise of innovative competitors. At bottom, enclosure is about dispossession. It takes what is yours and mine. It limits our freedom and self-determination. It damages ecosystems. It changes the character of the social order by making everything a money transaction, and it steals from future generations. That's why it's so important to name the commons as a commons. The language of the commons is important because it helps us name and confront the pathological tendency of markets to enclose that which belongs to all of us. But of course, the long-term challenge is to reclaim and reinvent the commons as a affirmative space for generating value for us. That's the subject of the next sections of this course.